Hello guys and gals, and this is part 13, the final part in Album of Horses. We will be reading some se some sections in here. Um, in the last one, we talked about the donkey, or the, bur the burrow, or the donkey, you know. And we also talked about the mule, so if you want to see that, that are, it's in the last video. Anyways, um, we are, this is a book, by the way, by Margaret Henry and illustrated by Wesley Dennis. And we are ready for the final two stories in the book. They are The Routine of Happiness, which I'm not sure exactly how long this is. Okay, these are the usual length. Okay. Okay. And this is called The Routine of Happiness. We're going to take a look at the pictures first, and it's probably going to be about the routines of horses or something. Anyways, let's get started. A horse's actions are based on habit. Variety may be the very spice of life for people, but for horses, routine is is a very is their peculiar happiness. Eat, sleep, work at the same time every day, year in year out. Time would time without end. There was once a workhorse that lived exactly by the clock. His name was Charlie, and he was, and he furnished the power that operated the presses for a printing house. Every morning, just as the factory whistle blew, Charlie was hooked to a pole connected to a shaft, and before the blast had pitched off in silence, Charlie was at work, walking around in a circle, turning the shaft with his with it which had a big wheel at the top of it. By means of a pulley, the big wheel was connected to a smaller wheel, and as Charlie turned the shaft, the pulleys inside the factory went around and around and worked the printing presses. All morning and all afternoon, too, Charlie walked in the perpetual circle, hearing nothing but the flump of his footsteps and the hum of the presses seeing nothing but his path and the sparrows that bathed in the dust he made. Charlie liked, th liked the sameness of his day. They were, n they were not drear to him at all. He knew what to expect and when. And when. Uh, he could have kicked over the traces and run away to green fields, but such a thought never occurred to him. And Mr. Dooley, the happy Irishman who took care of him, knew that he could be trusted after starting Charlie off. Mr. Dooley went about his own business and did not show up again until noontime, when he came striding along with a nosebag of rustling oats. Afternoons were just like afternoons were just like the mornings. Walk around walk around and around, turn the shaft, swish flies, sweat and dry off. Keep walking, walk the sun out of sight. When the evening whistle blew, Charlie stopped as if the stone, as if a stone wall had suddenly risen before him. This was a pleasant time of day. Mister Dooley unhooked his, unhooked him, and making little confidential remarks, the men and the boys whistled down the stairs and out of the building. One always stopped to give Charlie a slice of apple. The fragrant juices tickled his senses. He could smell the apple long before he saw it, then crunch, crunch, and the sweet juice sl slaking his thirst. Life was good. It had a pleasant pattern. Okay, we're going to take a look at these pictures first, since we are at an There. Year after year, when... Winter and summer, rain and shine, Charlie ran the presses until at last he grew old in service. His coat, which had once been smoky dark, was now white, and his mane and tail were sprinkled with gray. One spring morning, Charlie's orderly world suddenly went topsy-turvy. A shining black horse was brought into his stable and crossed and cross tied almost in front of him, of, of his stall. And Mr. Dooley was putting Charlie's collar over the young black's neck, and Charlie's wait, Charlie's bit into the young one's mouth. Secretly, Charlie disliked the newcomer. He broke into a snort and oh, penned, penned his ears back. Mr. Dooley went right on with his buckling. By the hole in the seat of my pants, he laughed. I do believe the old creature's jealous already. Then the young 
Then the young horse was backed between the shafts of the wagon and led out into the morning. And before Charlie knew what was happening, he was being tied to the tailboard. He tugged at his halter, trying to turn towards his familiar circle, but the wagon was starting up and he was being pulled out onto a hard dirt road, past a factory, past other factories, past houses, across a railroad track, and always he could hear the hoofbeats ahead. Strange new smells began mingling in his nostrils, plowed earth and apple blossoms. Suddenly the hoofbeats ahead came to a stop and Mr. Dooley was at his side, untying him now. Here we go. Untying him now, leading him through an open gate into a green pasture. Then, one by one, his shoes were pulled off, and even his halter was taken away. Okay. Oh, there I am. "'Tis little I can think of, think to say, Charlie,' Mr. Dooley murmured. "'You see, it's like this way.'" <laughs> oh, I see. I'm trying to make sure I'm getting this accent right. Uh... Uh, you, you see, it's like this way, Charlie. Ye earned a rest. The grass and trees be budden, and it's a, a southern, a southern piece of sod you got here, ain't it, Charlie? I and I'll come back every once and again and give you a, a whiskin over and an apple out of me own wages, and may the Lord preserve you, Charlie. Without a backward look, Mister Dooley gathered up the horseshoes put the halter over his arm and went out the gate. He clucked to the young horse and the wagon went creaking on its way. Charlie began to tremble violently. He threw back his head and sent out a great... Wait. Oh. Sorry, I keep getting lost. He threw back his head and sent out a great cry of loneliness. He ran along the fence line ahead of the black horse, quitting him to stop, imploring him. But the, young, but the young horse did not hesitate. He trotted briskly along, step by step, until the sound of his hooves and the creaking of the wheels gave, you know, grew fainter and fainter, and they died away. For a long time, Charlie stood in the corner as if he were picketing, picketed to the earth. He was a kind. It was a he was, He had a kind of naked feeling without his shoes and his harness, and he felt a nothingness inside. There was no one in sight but an old hound dog sniffing around a hedgerow, bent on bird business. Slowly, Charlie footed his way towards the dog, and as he walked, he felt a wet coolness under his feet. He pawed the grass, stirring up a delicate scent. He tore a mouthful and found it tender and succulent. He forgot about the dog and fell to grazing and he grazed the morning away. <clears throat> Towards noon, the bright sun beat down on his back, and a stupor came over him. He sought the shade of a big cottonwood tree, and there was a sweet liquid, oh, a sweet quid of grass in his mouth. He slept standing, dozing the afternoon away. For a few days, he enjoyed his barefoot freedom, then gradually a great longing filled him. He missed the old his old way of life, Morning came, and no one said, Move move over move over with you, Charlie. Ock! But it's a grand, smiling day. And there was no familiar path to tread, and no nose bag at noon or apple at night, only earth and sky, and between them the aching emptiness. The grass seemed to lose its flavor, and Charlie ate less and less of it. He grew gaunt, and his underlip hung low, quivering like that of an old man who cries easily. Mr. Dooley came to visit him and shook his head. We got the poor creature. Oh, we got the poor creature here just in time, all right," he said to no one at all. His work days are done for sure. Uh, his work okay. And then one early morning, the wind blew across the town, picking up smells and sounds on its way. The whistle of Charlie's old factory came to him faintly. The sound pulled the trigger in his mind and fired him to act. Result. Resu- Resolutely, he headed for the cottonwood tree and began walking around it, buckle, um, wait a minute, resolutely walking around it, 
buckling down to his work as if he were pulling the pole that turned the shaft around and round. He went, trudging and trudge and turn, keep walking, swish flies, sweat and dry off, trample the grass, bend it down, wear it down, wear the path bare, keep going. All morning he traveled the circle. At noon, the faraway whistle stopped him. He left his tree and grazed his way towards... Oh, the creek. There he rolled in the mud along the banks, first this way, then that. Afterwards he stretched out in the sun and snoozed a bit until the afternoon whistle woke him. Again the trigger in his mind. Struggling to his feet, he went back to his self-appointed work. All afternoon he wore the path deeper. By evening... The wind had turned about, and Charlie could, could not hear the whistle, but his time sense told him when to stop. He quit work suddenly and began frisking around the pasture like a youngster out, get let out of school. He waded in the creek and drank deep. Then he, spla he, he plashed until the water splattered all over his belly. He felt good. Now Charlie knew what to do each day, and the hours ran together as smoothly as water flowing downhill. In time, a great change came over him. He didn't look like a colt exactly, nor did his gray hair turn black, but his happiness showed in so many ways. In the luster of his eye, in the spring of his step, in the round-barreled look of him, Growing old was not bad at all, so long as there was something to do. Charlie had made his own work, and he was back in harness again. The good, com the good comfortable harness of routine. Now, we are going to read... <laughs> Stretch. Stretch. Uh, no sugar, thank you. I'm not sure what this is about, but um, it isn't very long, really. Okay, so... Let's get this started. Okay, first of all, we're going to look at these pictures here. I'm not sure what this is going to be about, but, uh... I guess it's about foals. I don't know. <coughs> Excuse me. The little colt sniff, uh, sniffed and the smell of morning... of the... Okay. I got a little bit tongue-tied on that one, sorry. The little colt sniffed and, and the air of morning tickled in his nose, and the whirly wind stirred the whiskers in his ears. He tossed his head, snorting and squealing. It was it was good, morning and the wind, and having his mother that this close. He kicked up to the sky and down to the earth, and with a wee flirt of his tail, scampered across the meadow. In long, easy strides, his mother overtook him, and now she is alongside, pacing him keeping him steady in the trot, schooling him. Big hooves and little hooves go winging along the grass, making fresh tracks in the dew. Only the fence line can stop them, and the mare shows bunting her young one away from it. They stand for a moment to blow and to snort, but the wind teases them, teases them on again. They wheel... Uh... Uh, wait, I lost my page. Um, they wheel and are off, galloping now, drinking and bracing air, uh, bracy air deep into their lungs, drinking in the morning, schooling how easy it is, trotting, galloping, using your tail as a rudder, kinking it around the curves. You youngins, keep away from the fence, keep away or I'll bunch you away. The danger signs are never forgotten that day. If the bulldog, the danger signs never to be forgotten. That day of the bulldog scare, the grinning beast lunging ready to grab at the colt's throat to hang on with his bulldog grip. But the mare's neigh, short, sharp, shrill, crying more plainly than any words, danger, come. And the little colt bolting for his mother, feeling safe and unafraid of her shadow. The mare teaches more than alarms. Uh, in fly time, she hovers over her cold, whisking and biting insects away with her fly switch tail. By and by, the colt learns the trick of it, sidling up to her just so, just so, head to tail, letting her shoo the buzz, the buzzing, whiny things, the whiny things away. A swish, and they're gone. If only mares could school humans. <laughs> if only mares could school school humans too. If only they could gentle humans in the kind and homely, 
homely things to do. Small ways, folk ways that horses like. Take the bit, for example. Take it on a cold day, the icy feel of it. How would you like it thrust into your mouth? The cold feel on the warm tongue. Two minutes will warm it. Your hands or your breath can do it. Okay. Uh, do you like having your nose stroked? Most horses dislike it too. Some will tolerate it and few may enjoy it, but most of them jerk away in distaste as if their dignity has been offended. If you can't resist the normal impulse of wanting to touch a horse's velvety nose, offer him the flat of your hand. Let him come sniffing and scenting to, your, to you until the, the feelers of his muzzle tickle your palm. He may even lick the salt of your hand with his big washcloth tongue in addition to the little moment when you have passed the test, you may, you have been accepted. Okay, let's um, look at this. 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 And this. Okay. To most horses, the sudden tightening of, of the girth strap is like the pinching of a vice. Why make it sudden? Why not do it? With by notches, easy on the first pull, proffering a wisp of hay to keep keep his mind and his grinders busy. Now check the bridle and the stirrups, and then come back to the buckling after another notch, another little handout of hay, and soon the girth is as snug as a hoop around a barrel. All this has been accomplished without ears flattened or teeth bared. Have you seen riders as they mount, fling their bodies onto the saddle, coming down on the horse's back like a sack of potatoes? It's enough to make him jump out of his hide. Some mounts do this, do take a sudden, do take a sudden lunge, almost unseating the clumsy rider. A good horseman mounts lightly, easing himself into the saddle with no shock at all to the horse, always Always he avoids startling the high-strung creature in grooming, in stable care, and in all his horse keeping his works calmly, talks, calm, talks calmly, with never a hustle or bustle. A jerky, head-shy horse is often telltale evident of an awkward master. Ever try to walk or run with a stone in your shoe and with a load on your back besides? Horses get stone bruised and corns just like people do. Before and after you ride, remove any little stones embedded in your horse's feet. He'll feel good, light, and airy as any ballet dancer. When the years pile up on your horse and his teeth wear down and his ribs begin to show, pamper him a little, try grinding his oats each day and watch him clean up his feed. He'll he'll lose his gaunt look and someone bound to say, hey, got a new horse there, haven't you? About this matter of sugaring your horse, don't, for his sake. A horse with a sweet tooth generally turns into a nipper and sooner or later he is apt to bite the hand that sugars him. Then punishment must be dealt swiftly. One way to avoid the need for punishment is to never give your horse any sugar. If horses could school their masters, the wise ones would say, Sugar, no thank you. Save it for your guests who come to tea. Some trainers believe in breaking a colt, some in gentling him. Breaking is the quick way, gentling him the sure way. A circus trainer once received a string of so-called well-broken horses, and at once he saw fear and hatred in their eyes. He might have refused to train them, but their distrust was a challenge. Before teaching any tricks, he had to start from the beginning, trying to change their opinion of man. For days, he took them into the ring during lesson time and just talked to them, letting them... Letting... Oh. Letting his voice go up and down the scale as if he were chatting with old, with old cronies. Gradually, the horses began to gather around, forking their ears this way and that. They seemed to like the sound of human voices, the trainer said, just because the because the horse is a dumb animal, it's no reason for the trainer to be. Another horseman I know um, soothes his horses with radio music. It keeps the fr the fractious colt from kicking, he says, 
and the lonely weanling from crying. One Christmas morning, as I walked into the stable, it was like coming coming on a nativity scene. High and clear through the air came the song, Away in a Manger, No Place for a Bed, and to the, to the rhythm of this gentle melody, the horses were munching their sweet-smelling hay, and the winter sun was streaming through the open door, and the fuzzy colt was lying drowsy and warm in a little nest of straw. Such peace and, and com- contentment filled the stable, and a mere human seemed an intruder. As I went crunching away in the snow, I had no words big enough for the peace and the good feeling. But, but suddenly a high joyous whinny floated out. Wait. Sorry, I got, I got lost. Suddenly a high joyous whinny floated out over the half door. It said all I wanted to say, Merry Christmas. And that was the entire book. Of album of horses by Margaret Henry and Wesley Dennis. If you like this content, make sure you like and subscribe and ring the bell so you know when I upload. If you want to support me in any way, all that information is in the description below. And as always, as always, everyone, thanks again and have a great day.